Howdy folks, welcome to our November edition of Cattle Trails Showcase. I'm Ron Wilson, I'm awesome. pleased to be your host. Uh, today we are zooming to Dodge City, the queen of the cow tents. We're excited about that. As we've done in recent months, we're opening our program with a Western trivia question. Uh, we invite you to type your answer in the chat. Um, in the spirit of today's topic, our question today is taken from the TV show Gunsmoke, which as you know was uh, set in Dodge City, Kansas in the 1800s. So our trivia question is this, feel free to answer in the chat. What was the name of the star of the show? Who was the actor who played the leading character and what character did he play? So what was that actor's name? <clears throat> the man who starred in Gunsmoke and what was the name of the character that he played? Easy question, I hope, and you can answer that in the, in the chat as we go. Um. Uh, <laughs> And, and we invite you to mute if, if you're not speaking. The purpose of the Cattle Trails Showcase is to continually highlight the communities, historical elements, museums, and other attractions along the Chisholm and Western Trail. Uh, the showcase is brought to you by the International Chisholm Trail Association. And uh, we have several of the officers on and give a wave. Uh, Dennis Katzenmeyer is our president. Uh, Michael Grauer is our vice president, couldn't be on today. Nancy Lawrence is secretary and Mary Lou Rivers is treasurer. Good to have you all on. Um, and Lonnie Steben is our Cattle Trails Showcase Chair and we'll be hearing from him later in our program. We do have good news to report. Uh, as you may have seen uh, on Tuesday, a US House hearing was held, a subcommittee held a hearing on the Chisholm and Western Trails legislation that would designate those as National Historic Trails. Um, our association presented strong testimony in support of that legislation, and uh, uh, the, legis the legislation was also supported in testimony by the U.S. Department of Interior, uh, subject to as yet unnamed uh, technical amendments. But the fact that the hearings were held, the committee held a hearing, included our bill, and that the uh, Department of Interior supported the bill, those are all very positive developments. So we'll keep you posted as things move forward. We talked about this a little bit before the show started. The hearing was about two and a half hours long or more. And the Chisholm Trail piece was only about five minutes out of that two and a half hours. Um, so I'm gonna put in the chat uh, a link to uh, a video that uh, just is uh, the, the, the Chisholm Trail and Western Trail testimony only. So you won't have to wade through all that long, long boring hearing. It was actually a good thing that the controversy that most of the time was focused on other legislation. Uh, so it's a good thing that, that ours is seen as non-controversial. It's understood as non-controversial. And so I think that'll help. Let's turn to today's program. Um, we're excited about uh, zooming out to, to Dodge City. Um, all of our showcases to date have been along the Chisholm Trail. And we it, so it's high time to go to the Western Trail, our counterpart, our partner, to the West and Michael Grauer, who's president of the Western Cattle Trail Association sent his regrets, he could not be on today, but we're certainly pleased to have Lynn Johnson with us. Uh, Lynn is assistant director of the Boot Hill Museum in Dodge City, Kansas. Um, she grew up uh, near Ashland, lives at Mineola today, is involved, uh, involved in the ranching business. I found an article which described Lynn, quote, as a living treasure trove of facts about the old West. So, uh, setting up a, a high high standard there. Uh, not only has she been assistant director for nine years at Boot Hill Museum, she recently road heard on the museum's uh, multi-million dollar new construction project, which I hope we'll hear about today. So Lynn, we look forward to hearing about the Boot Hill Museum and the floor is yours. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen. Thank you all so much for um, having me here today. I am thrilled to um, tell you a little bit about Boot Hill Museum and show you what's going on here in Dodge City. So um, well, I'll just jump in and get started with a little bit of history that we have here at um, the museum and I forwarded too much. So Boot Hill Museum, uh, actually in 2022, it's going to be a very big year here in Dodge City. We are not only celebrating Dodge City's 150th anniversary, but we are also celebrating Boot Hill Museum's 75th anniversary. So on uh, March 26, 1947, Merritt Beeson broke ground for the building that you see over here on the right. Merritt Beeson, of course, was Chalkley Beeson's son. 
So Chalkley Beeson was owner of the Long Branch Saloon as well as a rancher in the area. He served as sheriff, uh, fire department chief, just about everything here in Dodge. So uh, his son was here in 1947 and broke ground for the building you see. Um, the next building that we added is the picture you see on the left. That is the Fort Dodge Jail. Um, in 1959, the fort no longer wanted the building, but it being the federal government and things making never making sense, they um, were told that they could not sell the building, nor could they give the building away. So they gathered up the Dodge City JCs who wanted the building, which started the museum, the JCs did. And the fort told them, you know, if that building were to disappear, wink, wink, one night, we wouldn't do anything about it. So November 1st, 1959, they went out on horses, had a truck with a trailer, um, put masks over their, their faces. I'm sure like in the rest of Dodge City history, some whiskey was probably involved. Um, and they actually stole the building. So uh, that was then moved to the vicinity of the what we call the Boot Hill building that is still standing. And is, it remains there today in front of that building. So then the next expansions we had, uh, you'll see over on the right hand side of the screen is our front street building. So the first section of those was added in 1958. Um, and then the second section was added in 1963 to house the Beeson collection itself. Uh, front street was finished out in the late 60s, early 70s. Of course, we also have the Hardesty house that was added, our blacksmith shop. And then over here on the left, we have the Great Western Hotel that was added in 1982. Now I will preface this, I put the old picture of the Great Western Hotel to clarify, the hotel is not named after the trail. It is named after an actual hotel that we had here in Dodge City in the 1870s. That's the picture you see there in the middle. Um, and actually behind the Great Western Hotel is a very significant place in Dodge City history. It was Mayor Dog Kelly's house that of course he had loaned to Dora Hand and was she was staying in it when she was shot. So. Um, the Great Western Hotel you see there is a replica of the hotel that was actually here on Trail Street. So uh, the Great Western Hotel was the last real big expansion we had had up until um, just a couple years ago. So if you haven't been to Dodge City, but you're familiar with, with Boot Hill, you're going to be shocked next time you come to town because this will be in front of our Front Street buildings. So this is our expansion that we just, uh, the construction was completed in 2020. We just opened the new exhibits in the building um, last May in 2021. So this 13,000 square foot building was added um, through a program with the state of Kansas called Star Bonds. Uh, that is a sales tax program. So the state um, asks a city to establish a a star bond district, we have two here in Dodge City. Um, they look at the average sales tax um, raised in that particular district. Anything over that can be used to pay back bonds for infrastructure for things such as this with museums. So um, the city of Dodge, their star bond districts that they created um, were, they knew that there was businesses developing there, but they weren't yet opened. So majority of the sales tax in those areas goes to pay back these bonds. Um, so $4.3 million of the star bond of bonds was purchased to construct this building. Um, the, build, the star bonds itself will pay for the construction of the building, but it won't cover what they consider furniture or fixtures, which is finishing out the inside. Uh, so we then did a capital campaign for the remainder of the funds needed to complete the building, which was just over $2 million. So that uh, enabled us to get our gift shop, which is located in the middle of the building, as well as 12 new exhibits over on the west side of the building. So we are thrilled to have this. Um, you know, a lot of people don't realize a lot of the struggles we had through the years with our Front Street replica. We love our replica, um, but a lot of out of town guests who weren't familiar with us, it really confused them. They thought it was just a bunch of stores. Um, they didn't understand that there were exhibits inside, what they were missing out on. They kind of thought it was hokey. They'd get out, they'd take a picture through the fence and then they would leave. Um, another issue we had with the Great Western Hotel, which was our entrance, they couldn't find the front door. We would have people call us sitting in our parking lot trying to find how to get into the museum. So we um, not only gave us, this gives us more of a presence, it gives us a clear front door, 
um, but it enables us the new exhibits, which essentially uh, freed up space in other areas of the museum. So along with the 12 new exhibits we got in the new building, we're adding multiple more exhibits in space that we, we shifted some um, exhibits around in. So you can see the Front Street buildings behind there, um, but up on the top left, you can see the little white building. That's the jail that I just talked about, the Boot Hill building, the original building of the museum is uh, located behind that. Um, this entire block is what the original Boot Hill Cemetery sat on, and that's where we get our name. Um, when Dodge City was founded, it was located just outside of town, obviously up on a hill. Uh, so we have behind the Boot Hill building preserved that area as to tell the story of the Boot Hill Cemetery itself. So um, now I'm gonna give you a little sneak peek of what exactly we have inside the building. So we'll start with our um, Plains Indians, the American Indians exhibit. So a lot of these artifacts um, we already had, we moved from the building up on the hill, um, but we, when we redesigned this exhibit, we wanted to really give credit to the American Indian culture prior to the introduction of the horse, uh, since they were here for tens of thousands of years long before there was ever white men in the area um, to, to really give credit to that culture. And so it kind of has a glare over here on the bottom picture, but we have a timeline there. And on those shelves, we have um, bone shards, pottery shards, uh, mastodon tooth that coincides with different time periods on the timeline to show just how long uh, Indians were present in this part of the world prior to there being any kind of permanent settlement. Um, the dress over here on the bottom picture on the left-hand side, that is a new piece that we have on loan in our collection. That is a chief's wives dress for a Plains Indian um, tribe. And I wish I had a picture of it up close for you, but when you come visit, you can see just the detail of it and how amazing it is. It's a dress that was made around 1885, but when we put it in the case, I was, so shocked how just how soft and it the hide on it was it feels like it's just brand new you have no idea that it's as old as it is as well as it's been preserved um, on the top picture over towards the left on the bottom of that case we also have um, what looks like a rock but that's actually a meteorite of course the indians thought that was a gift from the heavens um, but i was shocked when i went to put that in the case just how heavy it was i could barely lift it no bigger size of rock that that is but um, so we do have some items that we've had in storage for years and years that haven't been displayed. And so we're able to, to give them a place now and, and put them on display for everyone to see. So as you transition out of the American Indian exhibit, we go into what we call our time of many flags. So we uh, named it this because of the different flags that flew over this area, uh, states and nationalities. Of course, we were part of Spain and France, Mexico, Texas, and finally America. The center of this exhibit, you see the large freight wagon there. So we tell the story of the Santa Fe Trail. Um, so to do this, we have an actual, this is an actual artifact, a 6,000 pound freight wagon. Um, it was not used on the Santa Fe Trail. It was built in the 1860s, used in the Idaho, Wyoming area, um, but it is very similar to the freight wagons like they used on the Santa Fe Trail. It is one of the smaller wagons that would have been on the wagon trains because the ones in the front and the back would have been larger. So this back wheel is just under six foot tall. The front and the back wagons, the wheel would have been well over six foot tall. It was quite a process to get this build this uh, wagon into the building. We literally built the building around it. We left a hole in the drywall, had about 20 guys that helped us move it in. Um, so yeah, it, I took some video, but you just can't quite understand what a struggle it was. It was put into the wall and then drywall built around it, the hole closed up. So I say, as long as I'm here, I know it is not going anywhere. But we utilize this wagon to not only tell the story of the Santa Fe Trail, but it tells a couple other stories in the back. We talk about, you know, you're traveling on the Santa Fe Trail. What would you take with you? Just kind of relating to kids, things like that. Um, then you can also see we, we show the introduction of the forts. So back here, this building is um, the Sutler store, which would have been on Fort Dodge leading up to the, um, the founding of Dodge. So then that takes us to our next exhibit called Raise a Ruckus. Um, this is what we tell that 
um, and this is a brand new exhibit. We haven't had this one before. Um, so the founding of Dodge, of course, is they there was too much drinking at the fort. The soldiers were just bored out of their minds. And so the commander outlawed drinking on the military reservation. So they had started planning a town off the military reservation five miles to the west. And so the gentleman here on this screen portrays George Hoover, who heard about that and um, went and got a wagon full of whiskey and cigars and came down to the fort and tied a rag around the wheel of his wagon and counted how many times that rag went around and measured out roughly five miles and set up his tent. And he set up uh, a bar on the end of his wagon and started selling whiskey and cigars out of the back of his wagon. That was officially the first business of Dodge City. It was the only business for exactly one day. They began building a grocery store and general store the next day. But um, we give uh, George Hoover a lot of credit for founding Dodge, not just because he was the first business, but because he his story carries on through the rest of his life. He stayed in Dodge, and it's pretty amazing the things he did for Dodge City. But the the center picture, um, these are what we we here at, at the museum have called our conversation screens. So by lifting up the shot glass you see there on the bar, it triggers George to come up and he tells you his story. And uh, these the production of these is just amazing. We're just thrilled to have it. Um, as you walk out of the tent, you can see over here on the left hand side, um, a couple different things to look at. One is the building of a frontier town. Um, this is to appeal to kids. The little covered wagon there runs along the bottom there of the pictures and it's to get across to them. You know, you're out here on the prairie. There's nothing here. You're going to establish a town. What businesses are most important to you? Um, and of course, the adults love it just as much as the kids do. So um, from there, we go into our Buffalo exhibit. So if you've been to Boot Hill before, you're familiar with the rumbling floor um, that we had with the stampeding herd. So we recreated that. So this darker square that you see on the floor there in front of the Buffalo, uh, if you stand there, the video projected up onto the wall um, shows a herd of Buffalo stampeding towards you and you can feel the floor rumble underneath you. And so, um, up here on the platform, we have for the kids, but also the adults alike, the signs actually say pick up the poop. We have five uh, buffalo chips here. You lift those up and it tells you different uses they had for buffalo chips. Um, sorry. Um, such as they used them to treat sunburn, hiccups, toothpaste, as well as fuel. So um, really glad we've moved past that. <laughs> So then as we exit out of the Buffalo exhibit, we go into our railroad exhibit, so, uh, or transportation. So the picture there in the middle, that stagecoach tells the story of travel by stagecoach prior to the train coming to Dodge City. This is not just any stagecoach. It holds a very special place in the Dodge City community. This particular stagecoach used to be a booth in the McDonald's here that we've had since the mid seventies. And so I can tell you, um, growing up in Ashland, the only thing that made it worthwhile to have to ride for an hour in the car with my mom to come get groceries on the weekends was knowing we were going to McDonald's and that we were going to get to sit in the stagecoach. But then it was devastating as a child to walk in and see another family sitting there and you had to wait your turn. So when the um, new owners of McDonald's decided to tear down the old McDonald's and build a new one, um, the whole community was was uh, all up in arms about what was going to happen to the stagecoach. So the new owners actually donated the stagecoach to us. They said, we don't care what you do with it, just so that the community knows we didn't just make it scrap wood. So we kept it in our warehouse and um, then we actually reconfigured it, uh, actually basically cut it in half so we could mount it on the wall. And we so you can still come sit in the McDonald's stagecoach. We prefer you not to bring your Happy Meals into the museum, though, when you come to sit on it. But it's it's a great piece for all of our guests, whether they know the history of it being at McDonald's or not. So then as you turn around from the stagecoach, you can see over on the left hand side what the train exhibit looks like um, over here on the right on the north wall. You see um, a car. A, a this was the first uh, makeshift depot was a railroad car, freight car you can see here. Um, uh, but of course, along the ceiling, you see um, there's a train track and you can barely see it right there, but there is a model train. If you push this big red button over on the right hand side of the picture, 
um, you actually get to conduct the train that goes around the top. And it's actually an, an Atchison, Topeka, Santa Fe uh, car. The uh, train is actually the Atchison, Topeka, Santa Fe. Um, and it's similar to the one that would have uh, made the first train to Dodge in 1872 in August of that year. So um, directly opposite of the stagecoach, then you can see the right hand side picture here. This is our depot. So this is was modeled after the current depot we still have here. Um, and that, of course, housed the Harvey House. So we have items that belong to the Harvey House here in Dodge in the window here. If you push the button, we have a Harvey girl that actually comes up and talks to you in the same fashion as Hoover did. Um, Dodge City has a very strong connection to Fred Harvey. His wife, wife's sister was married to Colonel Richard Hardesty, who lived in the Hardesty house that we have here on site. So Harvey uh, loved Dodge City. And of course, him and his wife would come to Dodge City often to visit the in-laws. So. And then we go to, oops, then we go to our cattle drive exhibit. Uh, so this, it tells the story of the Western Cattle Trail uh, or trails and um, why that's important to Dodge City history. Um, originally, we had planned up here on the, on the platform to have a full stuffed Longhorn and just the, the process to locate one, the time frame to get one, the cost of it just was not gonna be feasible with our budget. So we had a gentleman here in town who's retired, um, who was painting the murals for us in about half of the exhibits. And so he came up with this idea of using the mounts that we have on hand and painting their bodies onto them. So it looks like they're coming out of the wall. And I just love the way it turned out. I almost love this more than if we would have had the, the full Longhorn up there on display. Um, so, we, our museum designers that we used are actually out of Kansas City. And being city folk, you know, we take a lot of things, them being city folk, not us, we take a lot of things for granted, living the, the culture that we do out here. So they, at first, did not understand just how wide the horns on a longhorn were. They originally wanted the longhorn in the middle of the floor. Then we said no, because that'll impale too many guests. So we needed up on a platform. Um, number two, they did not understand brands and the branding alphabet. And so we had to take time out of one of our meetings to explain to them that um, there is a whole different al alphabet and a way of talking when you're talking about brands and the importance of brands. And so uh, the case you see here, we have several branding irons on display, but right here you see one of our gunfighters. He's got a brand book. So that was Chocolate Beeson's brand book from the 1880s that he carried with him in his pocket. It has all the brands from Ford County in there. And we also explain the alphabet over here on the, on the reading rail as well. Um, as you turn around and face the other way in this exhibit, you can see the windmill there. So um, that's one of the things we use to tell the story of what ended the cattle trails coming to Dodge City, the cattle drives. So we have a display of different kinds of barbed wire. Um, we explain the quarantine line, but then we also have the windmill here to show that that's really what helped along with barbed wire to establish ranches in the area to provide water where you never could before. This particular windmill used to be in the yard here at Boot Hill Museum, um, and it was restored by a gentleman uh, close to Dodge City. This is a 10 foot wide diameter windmill um, it would have been the smallest one that this company made. Most of the ones they made were 16 to 18 foot wide. So it was, we knew how big it was. We kept hearing how big it was, but you don't understand how big it is <laughs> until it arrived. And then the process it took to actually get it hung and suspended from the ceiling was just awesome. But we're thrilled with the, the statement it makes and how it ties into the rest of the exhibit. And then we move into our heyday exhibit. So. This is our clothing. This is our class and culture. Um, we tell the story of between the buffalo hunts and the cattle drives, just how much our founding fathers and the business owners in Dodge City, how much money they were making and how well of a life they were living. So, you know, their wives were able to wear the finest clothing and they um, could, you know, have the fresh oysters straight off the train and could live really the finest life that they could. So. Um, we show this um, exhibit here with the clothing. And of course we have the corsets. And so the kids, I always love to tell 
all of our school kids that come through the story of the corset. So your waist should have only been as big around as your age. So an 18 year old could only have an 18 inch waist. But the fact that these corsets um, constricted their lungs and moved their internal organs around and all while wearing all the different layers of clothing that could weigh up to 40 pounds. Um, and I like to point out to the kids too, they did all of this with no air conditioning. So it's no wonder that there was a lot of fainting couches going in the houses. So um, on the opposite side of that, you see this brick building here, this is our courthouse. So inside our courthouse, we talk about our lawmen, um, the names that you're familiar with, that Masterson, Bill Tillman, Wyatt Earp, how um, they were great lawmen and they did a lot for Dodge City, but how they also kind of had um, a different agenda on a lot of things. So, you know, the gambling and, and things, they walked a very gray area, um, very political. Uh, most of the fights in Dodge City are very complicated because they were so political about who was on what side of, of what argument and everything. Um, a really cool story from this process, as you can see, you can barely see them, but these pieces hanging from the ceiling here. So these 10 pieces, we, um, the Front Street building replica that we have actually burnt down in the 1880s. And um, the buildings after they burnt down were reconstructed in brick, right on Front Street in the same location, right on the railroad tracks. Unfortunately, in the late 60s, early 70s, Dodge City lost those buildings to urban renewal. Um, they knocked them down to create a parking lot. Um, still a very, very sore subject with a lot of people here in Dodge. When the Star Bonds uh, district was just getting formed and we started this process of planning our building and things, our warehouse was located directly south of the museum in an old brick warehouse. And there was some development that was interested in restoring that building and making it into a restaurant. And so um, working with the city, we found a new location for our warehouse um, for a lot of our collection and our larger pieces. So we started the process of moving our warehouse. And when we got into the basement of our old warehouse, we found these pieces up here. There are actually 10, but they came off the Front Street buildings that were torn down in the late 60s. And we had no idea that we even had them until we went through this process. And so these pieces were saved. So we were able to um, clean them up and restore them and, and have them on display uh, today in our, in, our warehouse, in our exhibit. So we're thrilled for that. As you leave the um, the heyday exhibit, you walk into the festive cowboy. So this is the, the front street culture, the south of the tracks culture. Of course, the dance hall girls and singers were not allowed north of the tracks, only gambling and drinking was allowed on the front street. The heyday, um, the class and culture, the, was, there was two, um, really two uh, cultures within Dodge City. There was the front street culture and there was what they called Gospel Hill which was the hill behind Front Street. That's where the business owners uh, raised their families, built their homes, their churches, their schools. So this is the festive cowboy. This is the Front Street culture and the Trail Street uh, south of the tracks. So um, one of the best known stories of, of dance hall singers, also one of the most devastating stories here, of course, is Dora Hand here in the middle. So we have a conversation screen here where she comes up and tells you some of her story. But Dora Hand um, was, a professionally trained opera singer from back east and she uh, came down with consumption and headed west for better health. She was married but had separated from her husband. So when she came to Dodge to perform, um, all the cowboys, all the men in town just fell in love with her. And she had a very kind heart. Uh, she would always be found early in the morning um, with a basket on her arm going out to the less fortunate to the sick, giving medicine and food to those um, who needed, you know, toys to the kids. So the women in town really resented her because number one, the, the men were all fawning over her, but number two, because she was willing to go out and do where they should have been willing to do, but wouldn't. And so um, the mayor dog Kelly uh, was always seen escorting her around town. Um, and because all the men were in love with her, there was one uh, particular cowboy from Texas um, Spike Kennedy, who took an extra liking to Dora Hand and actually got into a fight with the mayor. Mayor kicked him out of his bar, which was the Beatty and Kelly, and the, it angered Spike Kennedy. So that evening after that, he ro rode by the mayor's house and shot into the house. 
to get revenge on the mayor. What he didn't know is that the mayor had actually ended up out at the fort needing to have surgery and had loaned his house to Dora and one of her friends who was sleeping inside. So when he shot into the house, he shot and killed Dora instantly. He had shot into the house and then taken off out of town, was headed back towards Texas. And so what they call the, the vigilance committee was formed and took off to catch him, which was Bat Masterson, Wyatt Earp, uh, Bill Tillman, the sheriff. Uh, it, was, it was quite a, an intimidating group. They caught up to him between Fowler and me today um, and shot and wounded him in the arm. So they caught up to him and said, you're under, the rest, under arrest for the murder of Dora Hand. And he was just devastated. He had no idea he killed Dora. And he said, I wish you just would have killed me dead because now I have to live with the fact that I killed Dora and she was who I loved and what I was doing this for. He was uh, taken under arrest, brought back to Dodge City. His father was a very large cattle baron from Texas who sent a lot of cattle and a lot of money to Dodge City. So he came up, went into judges chambers for about 20 minutes, came out, his son was acquitted. They left Dodge and were never seen again. And nobody, nobody knows the details of what happened inside. We can only guess. Um, we also don't know where Dora is buried. So that is one of the great mysteries here at the museum. But you can see, um, we, we tell that story with her screen um, and the a mural here. We also talk about the um, only Spanish bullfight to take place on American soil took place here in Dodge City. We have this um, red sashes from the Spanish bullfighters. Um, they're illegal to um, host in America, but Dodge City said, we're Dodge City, we're gonna do it anyways. So. Um, we tell that story as well. So then we transition out of um, the good times into what I call like the one of the most depressing parts of the museum. We call this the fire and ice and it's really hard to, to really grasp what it's like in this area. But we start here with this, the picture on the left, tell the story of prohibition. So of course the law of prohibition was started in Kansas in 1881, but was not enforced in Dodge City until 1884 or 85. Um, when the law started being enforced here in Dodge City, of course, that changed the way uh, many of the business owners did business. They could no longer serve alcohol in their establishments. This was also around the time that the cattle drives stopped coming to Dodge City as the quarantine line moved west. Um, so many, uh, there was a way around it. It was Dodge City after all. Uh, many of the establishments just turned into restaurants, the soda fountains. But of course, you could still get prescriptions pretty easily for alcohol. We actually have a prescription in our archives of a lady who was written by a doctor that she could get enough alcohol to actually bathe in. So um, I don't, I don't it, there's, there was always that gray area here in Dodge. This particular back bar, I love to tell this story. So um, we actually located it on Facebook buy, sell, trade of all places for about $200 and had been sitting in a garage down in Fowler, Kansas. When we picked it up, they said, well, all we know is that it came out of the one, one of the front street buildings before it was torn down. That was a barber shop. And we know here at Boot Hill that the Long Branch Saloon, when it was rebuilt in the brick building, was the only bar in town painted white and that it was turned into a barber shop after the Long Branch closed. So we're pretty, we're like 95% positive that this is actually the back bar to the Long Branch Saloon that was saved out of the front street buildings. And we found it on Facebook for $200. So <laughs> Facebook can be a good thing. Um, so we tell the story of prohibition, but then also kind of, you can't really see it very well in this picture, but we tell the story of the blizzards. So many of the business owners, um, when they had to change their front street businesses, they'd become large uh, cattle ranchers as well, uh, very large cattle, herds of cattle. Um, so around the time of prohibition, of course, is when the blizzards came in in the winter knocked out entire herds of cattle. This picture here shows the train engine that was stuck in a snowdrift for about three days, full of people when the blizzard hit. Um, and then you turn around and this is the fire part of the fire and ice. And we talk about the fires that devastated the buildings. So uh, the business owners and the community of Dodge all within two years here, they, had, they lost the cattle drives coming to town. They lost the ability to sell alcohol in their buildings. They lost their cow herds, and then they lost the buildings themselves. Um, they say that the reason that the fires were so devastating in, in those years is because of prohibition. People weren't there all night long anymore to catch a fire and put it out before it wiped out the whole block. So where most towns would have just dried up, 
and never rebuilt. We um, then enter into our final exhibit here, which is, um, sorry, the spirit of Dodge. And so here we talk about how Dodge City rebuilt and reinvented itself over here on the bottom picture. You see all these men that were what we consider some of the founding fathers of Dodge as old men because they came to Dodge and they stayed in Dodge and they helped it reinvent itself and to rebuild so that it could survive. And I feel like Dodge City still does that today. You also have our last four screens here in this parlor setting. So from left to right, we have Mayor Webster. He was known as the fighting mayor. He was very forward thinking with um, like sewer systems and drainage on the streets and things. He did not see eye to eye with Bat Masterson. They, um, in fact, once it came to a head, Bat Masterson was out on Front Street just shooting off his guns and the cops wouldn't do anything because they were intimidated of Bat Masterson. And so Mayor Webster actually took his own sawed off shotgun and went face to face with Bat Masterson and got him to put his guns away and um, to end the altercation. Next we have, next to Mayor Webster, we have Wyatt Earp. And then we have Bat Masterson here. And then over here on the right, we have Chocolate Beeson. Chocolate Beeson, I've talked about before. The reason we um, give so much credit to Chocolate Beeson here at the museum, I mean, it's very significant that he was owner of the Long Branch Saloon. He was friends with all, with Wyatt Earp, Bat Masterson, all those names, but he started collecting a lot of items from early Dodge City. And his son actually opened the Beeson Museum um, which most of that collection then came, eventually came to Boot Hill Museum. So Chalkley really is the reason we have not only Boot Hill Museum, but why we have so many items from Dodge City here today. But when you activate the button here, you these four men have a conversation amongst them. And um, Ron was here just last month. I think he could probably fill you in on, on how great that is, but I um, <clears throat> just love the way it turned out. So then as you exit out of this exhibit, the last sign that you see before you go out, the last line, it says, with these new exhibits, you've learned the story of Dodge and now you get to step outside and you get to live the story of Dodge. So all along the back of the new building, we have a cover for our guests to um, sit and enjoy the view of Front Street, also to watch our gunfights that take place there in front of the Long Branch. But then after you've gone through these new exhibits, you get to go out into Front Street because none of those exhibits have changed and you get to walk along the boardwalk and you really get to experience a little bit of what Dodge City was like. Um, some other things that's going on this weekend, we have the induction ceremony for the Kansas Cowboy Hall of Fame. Um, these are some sneak peeks. Nobody has ever seen these before. We're just opening it up to our guests today. Um, but where our cattle drive exhibit used to be in the building up on the hill, we've actually moved our Cowboy Hall of Fame up there. So you can get a sense of a little bit of where our Cowboy Hall of Fame um, items are. And through the years, we've started getting items uh, donated from people we've inducted into the Cowboy Hall of Fame. So we're very proud of that. And like I said, tomorrow, we're actually honoring our 2020 and 21 uh, inductees, which one of those is our own Michael Grower. So uh, we're thrilled to be able to honor him tomorrow evening. So then uh, in the summertime, so Memorial Day to Labor Day, and then some into September, we have what we call our summer season. We have a Marshall Pass, which gets you show and dinner every evening, as well as admission to the museum. So nightly, we start with the gunfight, and then we usher you in for the country style dinner. Um, and then you end the evening with the Long Branch Variety Show, which this summer will actually be the 65th consecutive summer of the Long Branch Variety Show. It is the longest running show of its kind in the nation. So we're very proud of the legacy of the, um, of the Long Branch Variety Show. I'll just add the little can-can dancer over here in the pink's actually my daughter. So she's, she's retired. She no longer puts the corset on and dances, but um, we have through the years, uh, of course, with the museum being here for 75 years, we have some amazing stories of people through the years that, oh, I worked there in high school, or I met my husband there, or I was in the show and my husband was a gunfighter and that's how we met. So just the legacy of the history of the museum itself, I think is just as fascinating as the history of Dodge City. Go on to the next screen here. So uh, this just kind of Lays out um, during the summer, our hours are 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., seven days a week. Um, this time of year, we're open from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., Monday through Saturday, and Sundays, 1 p.m. to 5 p.m. We're only closed three days out of the year, which is Thanksgiving Day, Christmas Day, and New Year's Day. 
Um, the summer season, we offer the Marshall Pass, which is $42 for adults that gets you admission to the museum and the show and dinner. Um, if you were just going to tour the museum in the summer, it would be $18 for adults, $12 for children. Um, but we do offer a, an off season pass this time of year. So admissions actually $16 um, and then 12 or $10 for children. We do offer um, discounts to seniors and military. We're a blue star military museum. So actually it's free for active duty military members and their families year round. And I think that's the last screen I have, if it'll go. <laughs> yep. So that's all I have. And I'm, I don't know if you guys have any questions for me now or. When uh, absolutely outstanding. Uh, how about a virtual round of applause for <laughs> Lynn and the Boot Hill Museum? Um, Thank you. <laughs> and, and Lynn is right. I had the chance to be through there a month or so ago, and uh, the exhibits are outstanding. The, the Longhorns, as they're emerging from the wall, and the thing I spent the most time at was that last, that last room where they have the four screens of the four you know, leading citizens of Dodge City, and they, is, you're looking at this portrait, and then the portrait comes alive and talks, starts to talk to the other one and they interact. Um, so I, I think you've absolutely done a, a phenomenal job. Uh, are, there, are there questions for Lynn? You can put them in the chat or you can unmute. I, uh, Lynn, you told us the other day that uh, some, uh, how your attendance pattern is up. Oh, um, yes. And, uh, and also as much as 5% of your attendance is international. Could you tell us about how, the, how your attendance pattern has, has grown? Oh, yes. Um, so we, um, this last summer, we probably had the best summer that we've had in uh, over 20 years. So we um, were just, you know, we kind of, it was kind of the perfect storm for us. Uh, we had um, the, we had something new. We had the new exhibits. Uh, people were ready to get out and travel. Um, plus, we had done some new marketing to really target some some different areas. And so, our numbers, just numbers through the door, not income, we averaged an increase of about 27 percent this summer over 2019. So that's prior to COVID. Um, so the the goal of Star Bonds is really to double our attendance, which prior to our expansion. We averaged about 80,000 people a year coming to the museum. And so uh, we haven't got our final numbers for 2021 yet, but we um, were just thrilled with, with the summer we had and the increase we saw. So, and, and like Ron said, you know, 5% of our travelers are international and we haven't seen any international basically for two years now. So now that um, tr international travel is starting back up, we expect to really see an increase in those, those numbers as well. Um, it's always fun to, to look through our, our logs. We have our guests sign in in the Long Branch as well as at the entrance and see some of the places they come from. The first time I saw somebody from Kazakhstan, it was kind of shocking to me because you, <laughs> you don't think about uh, how excited people are to, to come to Dodge City and experience it. So It's a magical name really worldwide. And of course, the, the Gunsmoke TV show uh, uh, sparked a huge amount of interest. Great comment in the chat from Dwayne. Like many of us, he visited Dodge City as a kid. Um, and I certainly remember that, doing that. And uh, um, it, it's, it's worth a trip back to see how it's been preserved and, and transformed at the same time. Yes. Well, thank you, Lynn. Um, and, and Dennis Katzenmeyer, president, says he'll be there for the induction of the Cowboy Hall of Fame tomorrow night. Congratulations to Michael Grauer uh, for his induction into the Cowboy Hall of Fame. And, and thank you, Lynn, for, a, for an excellent presentation. You're welcome. Uh, I'm going to call on Lonnie Steven, who uh, has a special announcement about next month's Cattle Trails Showcase. Lonnie? 
Okay, thank you, Ron. And Lynn, thank you. That was a great presentation. And Ron, before I, I say any more, I want to thank you for your presentation at the hearing. You did a great job, and I, I'm, we couldn't have done this without you. And, you know, what have we been working on this 10, 15 years, and we're getting that much closer to making that a reality. So let's keep our fingers crossed. Thank you again for doing that. Um, you know, next month is December, and you know what? It comes up in December, and that's Christmas. So um, I did a little research, and uh, we, we need to go back to Oklahoma. We share between Kansas, Oklahoma, and Texas each month. And so I was presented the name of Jake Crumwitty. Jake is the director of the Cherokee Strip Heritage Center, and they have a thing on December the 10th, which we need to explain, Ron, that um, we're going to actually meet next month on December the 3rd to give us time for those that might want to make arrangements to go down on December the 10th and experience a Victorian Christmas at uh, in the Heritage Center in Enid, Oklahoma. And I'm, that's probably going to be on my list of something to do. Because And if you go to the website and Google uh, Christmas in the Village, Enid, Oklahoma, or you go to the Cherokee Strip Regional Heritage Center website, there's pictures of it. And there's, it's, they really have a, uh, on Friday, it's on a Friday night, but they do every Friday night, they have events going on at this, uh, in the Christmas in the village, but the December the 10th is their open house and it'll be the special night. So we are gonna meet and we'll hear from Jake in the presentation about the Cherokee Strip Museum. And then he's gonna also conclude with a tour through the uh, past Christmas in the village scenes. So looking forward to that. And again, thank you, Lynn, for an excellent, excellent presentation. So. Thank you, Lonnie. Thank you, Lynn. So our pattern is always to have our cattle trail showcase on the second Tuesday of each month for the month of December. We are changing that and we'll get an email notice sent out shortly. We'll be meeting on the first Friday so as to allow more time uh, for people to learn about the, the Christmas in the village uh, in, in Enid. Uh, so it will, our next showcase will be on Friday, December 3 at 10 a.m. And then we'll revert to our, to our second Tuesday pattern as we go forward. So be watching for an email on that. Thanks again to close our program today. This is Ron Wilson, Poet Lariat saying, thanks for taking time to join us in this place and come on back next month for our Cattle Trails Showcase. Happy trails, everybody. See you all.